All right, welcome everybody. So our speaker today is Michal Miskevitz um, from the University of Warsaw, and he will talk about the regularity of enharmonic maps. Um, thank you very much for coming and please go ahead. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here uh, to talk. Um, it's a great opportunity. And so uh, actually I will be talking about regularity of enharmonic maps, but uh, to indicate that I don't have all the answers, uh, regularity of enharmonic maps is still an open problem. So I'll add it, well, that I will be talking about my struggles. So you can expect it to be more of a, a, a overview of what has been done, what's not done and what methods are available. But, for uh, the experts, well, there are experts here, we probably know more uh, about it than me. Uh, I will also mention some new approaches that we tried and some partial results uh, that are new. So uh, this is joint work with Paweł Strzelecki and Bogdan Petraszczuk, both from University of Warsaw. Maybe I should add at the moment, I'm not at the university, but at the Institute of Mathematics at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Um, so we don't have, the, we're uh, finishing uh, writing up the paper, uh, but right now uh, nothing is out on archive. Uh, but I guess the most, uh, like uh, the thing that is most related to what we're doing is the um, survey paper uh, by Armin here and uh, Pavel Strzelecki, Invitation to Age Systems in Higher Dimensions non-results, new facts, and related open problems. So age systems are a different thing. Um, age systems are solutions of Sobolev class W1n of such an equation. Actually, it's not in, it's a system of equations, right? Uh, so we have N Laplace on the, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, there's a Jacobian and some H of U where H is a prescribed function, which we can think of as a prescribed mean curvature. So it's a different problem, but it shares many features with enharmonic maps. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of new insights in this uh, uh, survey. Um, also, there's a number of facts about enharmonic maps. So it's the most uh, related thing to what I will be talking about. Uh, also, the partial result I will be showing is very, very similar, strictly analogous to the one that is for H systems in that paper. So um, to say a few words about what are enharmonic maps and why we care about them. So let's start with something we all care about, uh, the harmonic functions we know and love. So just functions on Rn with values in R, which are critical points of the Dirichlet energy. And uh, well, they satisfy the, the well-known Laplace equation. Um, so we can generalize it in more than one way. One way to generalize it is to say, uh, let's consider the same Dirichlet energy, but now let's say our maps have values in a manifold, okay? For simplicity, let us take this manifold to be a sub-manifold of the Euclidean space. So here, because of this constraint, uh, if you look at the Euler-Lagrange equations for the functional, the, the equation with this embedding is a bit different. So you have this, second fundamental form uh, of the embedding, okay? So this is not linear anymore. It has the right-hand side, which is quadratic in the gradient. So the second fundamental form is evaluated at U, which is a point on the manifold, and then it's taken uh, on the derivatives of U. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is to say, okay, let us stick to R as our values but let's make the, the energy a bit different. So the exponent is not two, it's P. So the only difference now is that, well, the Laplacian becomes replaced by the P Laplacian. And for P equal two, you can see the divergence of the grid. So if you combine the two, you can have P harmonic maps. P harmonic maps are critical points of the P energy, uh, but with values in a given manifold. So you have both nonlinearities here, right? The P Laplacian on the left and the, the second fundamental form on the right. Yeah, here, well, 
because of this p energy, you have an additional gradient to the power of p minus two. Uh, and from now on, I will be only considering the case p equal n. So I say n harmonic maps to indicate that the, these are p harmonic maps where p coincides with the dimension. This is an interesting case uh, because this energy here becomes conformally invariant. And um, in certain ways, this is critical. Uh, so I will be uh, saying a few words now about why it's critical, why it's somehow on the verge of being easy for us. So the, the equation is like this. And uh, to be strict, I will be talking about weakly and harmonic maps, uh, meaning that, okay, uh, if the manifold is uh, embedded into Rd, then I consider W1n maps from, say, the Euclidean ball into Rd, but with the constraint that U maps into n almost everywhere. And it solves the equation in the weak sense. So uh, if, you, if you want, you can consider uh, p-harmonic maps without uh, embeddings, but then uh, you need some embedding, or at least that's the most standard way to do it. Uh, you need an embedding to introduce the weak formulation of it, if you expect singularities, for example. So uh, this is not the only um, notion of an enharmonic map. So you can consider not weakly enharmonic maps, which are critical points of the energy, but minimizing enharmonic maps. So say you give you have a prescribed boundary condition and you minimize the energy in some class. So for these maps, it is known that they are regular, okay, for some 30 years at least. Uh, also, uh, why I'm talking about P equal N. So if P is greater than N, then P harmonic maps are regular for quite trivial reasons because we assume they are in the symbolic space W1P. And if P is greater than the dimension, then the maps are uh, continuous just because of that. Like we don't have to use the equation. Uh, okay, we, we want if we, we need uh, higher regularity. Let's let's say that regularity is continuity here. So uh, yeah, so some things are known, right? This is why we consider weakly and harmonic maps. Uh, but also, if you consider p smaller than n, then you can expect your weakly p harmonic maps to be discontinuous. Uh, like in general, this continues. So there, uh, there's an example by uh, Rivière of two harmonic maps. So it's even p equals two, meaning you have the usual Laplacian. So no nonlinearity here. Uh, if you have p equal two but dimension equal three, then you can have this continuity everywhere. So mm, nothing better is expected in the general case. Okay. And also, uh, it's critical in the sense that if you assume that u is in w1n, then this thing here on the right hand side, it has, you see, n minus two derivatives here, one here, one here. Uh, the second fundamental form is bilinear. So you have like the size of it is the gradient to the nth power, which is just in L1, right? Um, and things like this. Uh, okay, even with the Laplacian, uh, but with the N Laplacian even more, uh, the solutions can be discontinuous. Like L1, uh, like the usual uh, regularity theory doesn't apply to the right-hand side with L1 in L1. Okay, the next slide. Oh yeah, because before we go to the next slide, uh, actually this is the same for H systems. So I mentioned that the, there is this um, Jacobian on the right hand side, which is well some kind of a product of n derivatives. So it's also in L1. Uh, it's another common feature between these two problems. Okay, so a little bit about general theory. So uh, we all know that the gradient, not the gradient, the Laplacian in L1 works bad. So even in R2, you can have a log log function which has integrable Laplacian, but it's not continuous. Um, what can be done better is that if you replace L1 by H1, the Hardy space, uh, 
um, then at least in 2D, uh, it works, right? Uh, I will say a word about the hardy space. It's slightly better than L1, and it ensures that the, in 2D, that the function is continuous. And actually, this is the source of the proof for the case n equal to. So for n equal to, the problem is solved by LM. So two harmonic maps uh, are uh, in 2D uh, are continuous or even smooth. But this result, it's uh, it works only on in 2D. So you could expect a similar thing in higher dimensions, but it fails. So uh, an example by uh, Firozie is that, uh, okay, you can have a function which has um, the n Laplacian locally in the Hardy space, but it's not continuous. And an example is like this. You just take uh, the sign of the logarithm to some power, and the power has to be like this. So we can see if n is equal to, you don't have this example, right? The, the interval is empty, but for higher dimensions, there's a, there is a possibility to choose the right alpha. So um, this doesn't work. And so some new insight is required for n greater than two. So the, the, the proof that is here doesn't generalize because it is, it relies on something very, very two-dimensional. So um, I mentioned the Hardy space, so let me introduce uh, these spaces. You probably all know them. So the definition of BMO, BMO stands for bounded mean oscillation, is that you take a function u, uh, you take a ball, br of x. Uh, this here, u br of x stands for the mean uh, on this ball. And if you take the difference, like the, the, the distance to the mean, then the average distance to the mean, uh, average again on the same ball, has to be bounded, right? Uh, that's the definition of the BMO norm. Uh, you can consider U to be in BMO if, if this is bounded, right? Uh, we take this, if you want to consider it as a space, like a normed space, it's better to think about these functions as modulo constants, because if you put a constant function here, uh, you have a zero. So uh, it, it has a norm of zero. So uh, BMO is good. Um, it works as a good substitute for L infinity. Um, so all, all bounded functions are trivially uh, of bounded mean oscillation, just because U is bounded, the, the average is bounded, and this thing is also bound. So that's trivial. Uh, but it doesn't work both ways. The logarithm is an example of a function that is in BMO, but it's not bounded. And uh, it's a good substitute because also it's in all lower LPs by John Nirenberg uh, inequality. And uh, the way we're going to use BMO, uh, we won't like, directly work with these uh, mean oscillations. Uh, we will use Poincaré inequality. If you have an integral like that, the Poincaré inequality uh, lets you uh, estimate it by an integral like that. Okay, there of course there has to be okay. There's a constant depending on the dimension. So I'm hiding the constants in this tilde here, um, and also a normalizing constant. So the radius has to appear with the right uh, the right power. Um, so it looks like this. Uh, if you have the gradient of U in the right Moray space, then you have a BMO bound. But uh, the most, the easiest way to use it is to take P equal N. If P equals N, well, this disappears, right? We have a one over here, which means that uh, it's enough for the gradient to be L N, L1, Ln, sorry. And the BMO norm is just bounded by the Ln norm of the gradient. So W1N functions are in BMO, which is also non-trivial because these functions uh, can also be uh, unbounded. OK. And a few words uh, about the Hardy space. Um, it's, uh, it's important because it's the pre-dual, but uh, it's a good, good substitute for L1. It's a smaller space than L1. Uh, because we require u to be in L1, 
but also the maximal function of u. So a maximal function, not in the sense of uh, averages on balls, but we take these mollified averages. And if that's in L1, uh, then we call it an H1 function. And the main thing we want uh, about it is the Pfeffermann-Stein theorem that the dual space to H1 is BMO. So we will encounter integrals like this, where we have a product of something in H1, something on BMO, and uh, we can use both norms to, to bound it. OK, so uh, that's all for uh, technicalities. And now I will talk about a special case. Um, so there are some special cases where the main problem, so continuity, say, of n-harmonic maps, uh, the problem is solved. So if the, the manifold, the target manifold, happens to be the round sphere, then it's known for, you see, uh, also 30 years. Yes, 30. Uh, it was proved independently by many authors. Uh, I will talk about the reasoning by Strzelecki. Uh, and OK, why I want to talk about it? Well, it was proved uh, decades ago. But uh, the proof here will be somewhat reminiscent uh, of the proof we came up with. So. Uh, our approach for the general case is somewhat similar to that one. So let me quickly go uh, through this proof here. OK, so the equation is like this, right? The n Laplacian equals the second fundamental form. But for the sphere, the second fundamental form is just the, uh, the dot product. So we're left with, well, the gradient. Oh, sorry, there should be well the dot product times u, right? It has to be a normal vector, not just a number. Uh, so there should be a u here. And so we're left with the gradient to the power n times u. Um, the trick, which I will call the anti-symmetrization trick, uh, goes like this. We rewrite the right-hand side, uh, the i-th component of that, as well in this fancy way. Uh, before I say why it's advantages, let me just say why it's true. So if you look at the first term here, uh, then if you sum it up over all j's, so you just have, well, that times that, it gives you the gradient squared. So the gradient squared together with that gives you the right-hand side, right? So what about the second term? The contribution of the second term is zero, just because if you sum up over all j's, this green stuff here, it's zero due to orthogonality. So that's because u, uh, well, u is both a point on the sphere and the normal vector at that point, right? While uh, all derivatives of u are tangent because u maps into the sphere, so uh, the, the derivatives are tangent. So, so that's a trick we use to rewrite it in, a, in such a way. Let's call it omega ij. And then the equation here can be written like that, OK? Um, and omega, well, has the size of the gradient to the power n minus 1. Um, I call it the anti-symmetrization trick because if you switch i and j, you see that omega ij is minus omega ji. Um, but that doesn't uh, explain why it's useful in any way. It's useful because uh, omega is divergence free. So it's better than what you would have without the trick. So that part would be without the trick. If you compute the divergence, it's not hard in any way. But uh, if you take the divergence, you can put the divergence either on, uh, say, ui or on the rest of it, right? So we have four. Uh, four terms in, in total, and two of them cancel. So if you take the gradient here on ui and gradient here on uj, it cancels. And you're left with, say, OK, divergence of that and divergence of that. We know what it is by the equation, right? Minus the divergence is the gradient to the nth power. So 
if we put it here, then again, these two cancel. Right? So this is zero. So um, the outcome is we rewrote it like this and uh, this omega has divergence zero. And now uh, this is, okay, it's not, for these authors, it was uh, really something new uh, that such a product lies in H1. So if you have a gradient and then something of the size gradient to the power n minus one, then well, the product is what we know, the, the size of gradient to the power of n. So it is an L1, but due to this special structure, something divergence free times a gradient field, uh, due to that, it lies in this hardy space with some cancellations. Uh, or more precisely, normally you would say that the L1 norm of this product can be uh, can be um, can be estimated in this way, but now this theorem says that uh, this product is also bounded like this in H1 in this better hardy space. Okay. Uh, it's useful because we can use duality uh, of Pfefferman and Stein. So if we test with U, okay, I shouldn't test with U, right? I should use some test function, uh, some cutoff functions, but uh, all cutoff functions will be ignored here. So you can expect things that I'm going to write are not true. They are true, like morally. Um, but then uh, it, if you say ignore all the parts where some derivatives touch the, 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 the cutoff function, if you take u here as a test function, you integrate by parts, you have the gradient to the n minus two times gradient squared. So it gives you the gradient to the power of n. And on the right hand side, the naive thing to do would be to say, uh, use L1 norm of that an L infinity norm of that. Right? Well, U has an L infinity norm of one, which is well finite. Uh, but then this would give you, well, it would give you the same thing as on the left hand side, but with a constant. So it would be useless. Um, the advantage here uh, of the idea is that if you use H1, you can use BMO here because of the duality. And as I said, the BMO norm is controlled by the ln norm of the gradient. So in the end, you get uh, this ln norm of the gradient to the power of n is uh, the power of n here and to another power of one because of this BMO, right? So um, the, there is a difference between powers of the gradient on both sides. And if this were true, this would imply that uh, the grade, this uh, LN norm has to be bounded, right? Just because not many numbers have this, uh, numbers T have this uh, opportunity that T to the N is smaller than T to the N plus one. But of course, this is not true if you use cutoff functions and you are careful enough, you, you get some uh, additional uh, error terms. You need to use uh, the hole filling trick. So be, the hole filling trick is already used here and it produced a constant tau, which is uh, smaller than one. So the, the, that's not very fancy. And then you see on the left hand side is uh, the gradient of n, the gradient of u to the power of n on a small ball if we use the cutoff. And on the right-hand side, we have the same integral, but on a larger ball, of course. And then um, because we didn't you, uh, do it the silly way, we, we use this improved estimate, uh, we get an additional uh, ln norm of the gradient inside, right? And because of that, this is small if r is small. Normally, yeah, if you didn't have this, it wouldn't be small, it would be a constant. But now, if uh, the gradient to the power of n is integrable, then on small balls, this norm can be arbitrarily small. So say there's a tau, but there's all still some space between tau and one. So you can make it, say, one plus tau over two, right? 
and if it's uh, smaller than one, then you can see uh, if you go from a scale to scale, from 2R to R, then R over 2, R over 4, and so on. It decays geometrically because of that. Uh, and so you can say in general that the decay as a function of R uh, is some polynomial, like R to some positive power. And by standard uh, argument, it's like some kind of Moray theorem, U is Helder continuous. So this, um, this last part here is very standard. So I just want to stress that, yeah, it, it works like this. Um, the main thing we want is to have um, the norm of the small on the smaller ball here, the norm of on the larger ball here. And we want some improvement. We want some additional norm uh, next to this constant. Okay. Um, and now I will say how to how, how we can try to mimic the proof in the general case. So maybe I should say uh, the sphere is not the only special case where people were uh, able to to have this um, uh, result. Also, there are other uh, manifolds, compact homogeneous spaces uh, with lots of symmetries in which you can mimic the proof, use the symmetry and do it this way, more or less. But in general, um, the, the thing that has been used in the literature already for many years is Wollenbeck's decomposition uh, or gauge transformation. Um, so let's start with uh, the anti-symmetrization trick, okay? So in general, we have this second fundamental form and we can rewrite it in this anti-symmetric way. It's anti-symmetric in I and uh, in K and J, right? Okay, so the first term, the contribution of these green terms, if you sum it up over J and K, it's exactly the second fundamental form. And again, if you take the second term and sum it up over J, then you have a dot product of some coefficient a chi i of the second fundamental form. And because a takes values in the normal bundle, and again, the derivatives of u are tangent, then by orthogonality, this is zero. So it's the same reasoning we had before. And let's call it omega again. And this omega, oh, sorry, it's anti-symmetric in i and j. Yeah, it is. Uh, so there's a subtle difference between what we did for the sphere and what we're doing right now. So the difference is before for the sphere, the right hand side didn't have this. So this gradient to the power of n minus two was part of the omega here for reasons I will explain in a moment. Uh, we put it outside. Okay. Uh, so now omega has the size of the gradient because the second fundamental form is like, it has some bounded coefficients. All right. So the problem is we do it, we have uh, an anti-symmetric omega, but it's not true in general that the divergence of omega is zero, or it's not true that the divergence of this thing is zero. So in the sphere case, what we are looking at was actually omega times the gradient to the power of n minus two. So what can we do? Mm, also nothing new. There's Ullenbeck's decomposition. Um, the statement here, first thing, it's not really precise. Um, there are some assumptions missing, uh, but it looks more or less like this. Uh, also, I have to say it first appeared in a geometric context, the way Ullenbeck uh, was talking about it. Uh, but uh, I think it was due to uh, Tristan Rivière, uh, who rephrased it in a purely analytic language. So there's no manifold involved uh, in, um, in this decomposition. So uh, the theorem goes like this. There is, say, omega is not divergence free, but you can choose a field of orthogonal matrices, P, such that if you look at omega bar, this is the transformed omega, uh, which is P transpose gradient of P plus P transpose omega P, then this new omega is divergence free. 
So this uh, P describes a gauge transformation. So it's, uh, well, like a change of basis in each uh, tangent space separately. Um, and why it's important for us, it's not actually the part of the theorem, but you can check that if U satisfies such an equation, a thing like this, then if you look at the divergence of a similar thing, if you put P, T, P transposed here, then it satisfies a similar equation with say P, T added here and uh, with omega replaced by omega bar. So that's why this, uh, this is important for that case. Uh, also, I'm not uh, using precise uh, norms here, but P is somehow controlled by the omega. So for example, you can expect uh, it to be true for LN norms. All right, so um, yeah, you can think about it as a trick that solves this problem, right? If omega is not divergence free, you can somehow transform it, uh, have a transformed equation, which is, well, not so nice, but still uh, omega gets replaced by something divergence free. So this is the same theorem again. Uh, so let me just uh, explain why the transformed equation looks like this. Uh, so yeah, our starting equation is like this, but with V, which is very special, the gradient of U to the power of N minus two times the gradient of U. So let me maybe go back one slide uh, with this V in mind, right? This thing here is V. And if you call it a V, then the right-hand side is just omega times V. Okay, and if you have something like this, if you take the divergence of PT times V, well, there are two terms. Uh, the divergence term uh, you can replace by the omega times v. This is not very uh, fancy. And then you have the gradient of pt, but because p is orthogonal, like it's a field of the orthogonal matrices, then ptp is always an identity. Uh, so yeah, if you take the derivatives of it, these are zero, and you can compute the derivatives of pt in terms of the derivatives of p. So this is done here, right? Uh, the gradient of PT is replaced by the gradient of P. Okay, uh, and so what if you pull PTV in front or rather in the back of it, then you're left with say PT gradient of P here. And here you have PT omega. And well, because we pulled PT here, we need to put P uh, before it, right? So that they cancel each other. So yeah, uh, this thing you see here is exactly omega bar, right? It, that appears naturally in this context. And yeah, PT times V in our context is exactly the right-hand side, okay? So um, yeah, it works like this way. And now uh, I want to mention um, some very small, I hope, new insight. So if you, we consider the transformed equation, this is nothing new. So you, you can find it in the literature in many places. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to prove that a weak limit of enharmonic maps is enharmonic as well. So if you want to prove uh, weak compactness of the space of solutions, uh, then uh, it's due to Chang'e Wang that it's true. And you need to look at uh, this Uhlenbeck's decomposition, this transformed equation, and due to its uh, like, uh, divergence-free structure of omega bar, uh, you can do it. So there's a number of ways in, you, in which you can well, exploit this structure. Um, the thing I will be talking about is that in this form, the right-hand side of the equation is small in L1. So what I mean by small, if you, well, if you're being naive about it, you see a gradient uh, to the power n minus two here, 
a gradient here, so you have n minus one powers. P is bounded, so it doesn't matter. Omega, again, omega is P times, it's like the size of the gradient of P, which is bounded by the omega, which is bounded by the gradient. And also here P is bounded, you're again left with omega, which is of the size gradient of U, okay? So forget what I said. It's just that the size of the right-hand side is pointwise, uh, okay, maybe not pointwise, but it's a gradient of U to the power of N, okay? So it's in L1, but the size of it, it's like this, right? The LN norm to the nth power. So this additional power is, well, a step uh, ahead, a little one at least. So you may remember in the proof for the spheres, uh, the main insight, the main like, step forward was to bound the right-hand side, test it with U, so that you use H1, DMO, and then instead of the gradient of U to the power of N, it appears in the power N plus one, right? And so uh, it is something good for us. Okay. So uh, I think I do have enough time to uh, give you a sketch of the proof. Uh, just to show you that the methods, the tools that uh, are used. So uh, it's enough to show that this omega bar is of this size. If you take it naively, omega bar has the same size as omega, so it has the size of the gradient of U. Um, but if you have this uh, improvement, then because you have another gradient here, another gradient to the power of n plus minus 2 here, it is enough to show that, okay? So um, note a few things. So first, A, I, K, J are coefficients of the second fundamental form. So these are bounded, right? Because, well, we are given the manifold, whatever it is, it has some bounded second fundamental form. P, I, J, that is the coefficients of these orthogonal matrices. These are also bounded. Um, so I said it's bounded, but if you take the derivative of it, um, I'm not writing it, but these are coefficients of the second fundamental form at point U. So if you differentiate it, then by chain rule, the der derivatives of U appear as well, okay? So the derivative of that is well, pointwise bounded by the gradient of U just because it appears in the formula. And uh, P is similar. If you take its gradient, it's not pointwise the same as the um, derivatives of U, but by Uhlenbeck's decomposition, we have some control like this. The gradient of P is bounded in terms of omega, and omega is, of course, bounded in terms of the gradient of U, just because, well, it's like this. So um, uh, you can see omega bar is, like, it's not a nice form. It's non-homogeneous in a way, but you, you can see that all of the terms that appear here are of the same form, something controllable times a gradient. So for example, um, this thing here, PT omega P. So you have the gradient. Inside omega, you have the gradient of UK. So this plays the role of gradient VS. And then you have the coefficients of the second fundamental form, which satisfy these uh, conditions, right? They are bounded and they have uh, derivatives bounded ln, ln. But then it's multiplied by p, pt, but p and pt are also the same. They are bounded and the derivatives are bounded by the derivatives of u. So this part here can be written as such a sum. And actually these vs's are just u, uk's, right? This is the solution here. And this part is similar because the gradient of P, uh, the gradient of P, I, J is bounded by the gradient of U and then P is bounded, okay? So they look different, but they have more or less the same structure, the same behavior. So I want to, uh, maybe that's the, <laughs> the only insight I have into this problem is that this omega bar is divergence free because of the Uhlenbeck decomposition, and it's almost gradient-like. So if you ignore this B case, it is gradient. 
And I want to say that decays are like close to constant, close to constant in, in this regard here. Uh, and if I said not almost, um, you would be surprised, right? Because if you have an LN field, you can use Hodge decomposition into its divergence free part and its gradient part, right? So it's one or the other, it cannot be both. So because omega is divergence free and at the same time close to gradient, um, this can have some uh, improvement for us. So let me rewrite it here. Uh, the, uh, we want to prove that omega bar is bounded like the ln norm of it is at most square of the ln norm of the gradient of u. And so yeah, that's the form that we got. And the blue box I want to use here is the commutator estimate by Kaufman, Rothberg, and Weiss. It's, uh, as you can see, it's uh, 17 years before this paper by Kaufman, Lyons, Mayer, Sems about Hardy spaces, which I cited before. But actually, uh, uh, this other result can be seen as a, as a corollary of that one, of that here. So it looks like this. Uh, you take a calderon zygmunt operator, you take a BMO function, and then you take a commutator. A commutator, which means that either you first take your function and multiply by B, and then apply K, or the other way around. You first apply k and then multiply by b. So if you want it to be uh, bounded on LP, the naive way to do it would be, well, assume b is bounded, right? Multi k is bounded on LP, and multiplying by a bounded function is bounded on LP. And well, you cannot do better than that unless you use a commutator and the cancellation phenomenon in this commutator uh, gets us this improvement that it is enough for B to be in BMO, okay? So each part, this part alone is not bounded on LP, this part alone also, but the difference between them is bounded. So you can see that's another place where we can get an improvement and instead of using L infinity, we can use BMO. And the way we're going to use it uh, our calderon zygmunt operator will be the, the Hodge decomposition operator. So each f can be its vector field in, say, ln, uh, can be decomposed into its gradient part and its divergence free part, and k will be the divergence free part of it. Yeah. So it's known to be the, uh, an operator like that. And so if you apply it to the gradient, what happens? the gradient decomposes trivially, right? The gradient has its gradient part like as itself and zero divergence part. So you get a zero here, which means that if you apply uh, the commutator, then uh, this part here disappears, right? Because K of the gradient is zero, you're left with that part, okay? Mm, and you can see, well, BS, uh, it looks like this. Okay, so the, uh, that's for the gradient. What about uh, omega bar? We know that omega is divergence free. So if you apply the Hodge decomposition to it, you get uh, omega bar itself. So that, these are the same thing. But now, uh, okay, omega bar is a sum. Uh, so you can say that it's k of omega bar is the sum of k of that. But since Oh, it's the sum of these things, right? But I just said that the sum of these things is the same as the sum of commutators. Okay, and now if you use triangle inequality uh, and you compute the ln norm of that, then, well, it tells us that uh, this thing inside the sum is at most BMO norm of BS times the ln norm of the gradient uh, BS. So you, you see the improvement here, right? It's not L infinity on BS. This would be the, the trivial uh, observation, but now you have BMO here. And this is, uh, yeah, look, this is the, the, the only thing that's needed. This BMO norm, okay, it's quite technical, right? But this BMO norm is bounded by the LN norm of the gradient. 
And the ln norm of the gradient uh, in our context is bounded by the ln norm of the gradient of u. So you get uh, the norm of the gradient of u here, the norm of the gradient of u here. So you have, uh, you have it squared. And if you remember the other powers of the gradient of u on the right-hand side, then you get uh, this plus one here, right? This plus one is exactly due to this BMO. Okay. If there are any questions, please, uh, please interrupt me. Mm. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, say a theorem, but it, it is or it isn't useful. <laughs> we still don't know exactly. So let me say a few words about possible next steps that one can take. So that's the equation. Um, one possible step is to test with u. If you test with u, um, the right-hand side is okay. So you can even use the silly estimate, the naive estimate, L1, L infinity, and it's still okay. U is bounded just because it maps into a manifold. And uh, in this L1 norm of the right-hand side, you already get this improvement of another uh, gradient. But on the left-hand side, you see, you if you integrate by parts, you get PT gradient U times gradient of U. So it's not the gradient of U squared, okay? So it, it doesn't give you the, the, the lower uh, bound that you would expect. So this simply doesn't work. Uh, and it's because we used the uh, Ullenbeck decomposition and we somehow uh, destroyed the, the structure we had on the left-hand side, unfortunately. So another thing you could try is use the Hodge decomposition. So decompose PT gradient U, right? This thing here. So you get, say, a gradient of phi and some divergence free part psi. So here, on the left-hand side, well, gradient of phi is PT gradient of U minus psi. So if you can prove, and you can using the commutator estimate, that psi is in some way small, then you're left with uh, PT gradient of U. So this gives you PT gradient of U squared, which is the same as gradient U squared, okay? So up to this error resulting from psi, the left-hand side is okay, but now the right-hand side is okay. Using the Hodge decomposition, we destroyed this additional information here. So U was bounded, but now if you took its derivative, which is an LN, you take the Hodge decomposition, then phi is in W1N, which is nice, but it doesn't mean that phi is, uh, is in L, L infinity. So even though the right-hand side is small in L1, uh, well, testing with phi is not enough to, 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 to take advantage of that. So this doesn't work. Mm, um, an interesting open question. Does BS, this B that appeared inside omega bar, times phi still belong to BMO? So if you take this phi and somehow hide it inside omega bar, let me take a few steps back. Uh, if you take this phi and put it here next to B, then you, you can try the same thing uh, and you have like a new B and now you have a BMO norm of this product, B times phi. So if this product has a good BMO estimate, then we're fine, right? Uh, everything stays the same. So, uh, but the problem is phi doesn't have to be bounded. So it's not clear that the product is in BMO there is a characterization in the literature uh, when some products are in BMO and when they aren't, uh, but uh, it doesn't lead to a direct solution of the problem. So it is maybe some possible avenue, but, uh, but it didn't work for us. And uh, okay, uh, the last thing I want to mention is that you can uh, use the Hodge decomposition, not on PT gradient of U, but on PT gradient of U, divided by a small power of uh, the gradient, okay? And in this case, the left-hand side is not only in Ln, but in Ln over one minus epsilon, right? 
a little bit over n. So it's better. So that leads, that would be the, the, the last slide that leads to this uh, partial conditional result that we had. Um, those of you that uh, are familiar with the survey paper by uh, Paweł uh, Strzelecki and Armin Szykola here, um, uh, you can recognize a similar partial result for uh, H systems. So here, if you take an N harmonic maps, by definition, it's in W1N, but if you assume additionally that it has N half derivatives, and these n half derivatives are in L2, then under this additional assumption, the map is continuous. So it's a large assumption, right? N half derivatives, uh, but well, it's still not trivial, right? This uh, assumption doesn't uh, imply that U is continuous by itself. Okay, so a very uh, sloppy sketch of proof is to say uh, we work below the natural exponent. So we take the Hodge decomposition of what I said. And now, because the left-hand side is above Ln, then phi is in a better Sobolev space, and it's bounded. Uh, our aim is very similar to the sphere case. So you can remember a similar estimate. It's just that epsilon was equal zero, right? So on the left-hand side, you had just the integral of gradient to the n, and the same here. Right? So we introduce this epsilon, but if if we can do it with this epsilon, if we use not the well just the integral, the ln norm, but uh, a more norm, then it's still okay. If you have such an equality with tau still below one, uh, you can use the same tricks, uh, the same standard arguments, and have some power decay of that and continuity of you, okay? So once you have such an estimate with this improvement here, we're done, it continues. Okay, on the left-hand side, things are quite easy. So uh, if you integrate by parts, you get the gradient, PT gradient of U, gradient phi, which is again, gradient of phi is almost that, right? If you put that, you get the gradient power of N minus two, one power here, one power here, minus epsilon here. So you get n minus epsilon. Exactly. Uh, but there's an error uh, because of this psi. So this psi now, um, you need the commutator estimate uh, to say that it's small without epsilon. And you need a stability result by Ivanitz and Bordone to say that if you introduce an epsilon here, psi is still small. So that's very technical, but true. And with the right-hand side, L1 smallness of the right-hand side is enough because this phi is continuous. But there's a problem. If you do work out the details, you can see that this thing here, uh, it, it, it's not true simply. Uh, it's inevitable that this gradient, um, there will appear an L norm, Ln norm of the gradient, and it will be an Ln norm in the power N. Right? Uh, maybe I should make this upper uh, N uh, red for this. So th this is a problematic. It's not exactly like this. And there's a workaround. Well, a cheap one. That's the only part when we use the additional assumption. So if you assume these derivatives are in L2, then you can bound this bad term, this gradient uh, as Ln to the power of N. Uh, interpolate between this, these high derivatives and BMO. So again, it's a sharp gallardo nirenberg inequality uh, because the usual one would have L infinity here, but actually you can work it with BMO, which is due to Strzelecki. Uh, and yeah, it's useful here. So um, yeah, that's uh, this that's somehow, somehow not satisfying that there's one place in the proof where where you, you have such a technical problem, which probably um, probably stems from some more fundamental problems, a problem, and one can expect that, uh, that the, 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 the heart of the problem is still untouched, but uh, 
but I hope that uh, this provides at least some new insight into the problem. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you very much. Come on.